All right, hello everybody and welcome to the AMS Mountain Meteorology webinar series. I'm really happy today to have Matt Juglum from the National Weather Service Western Regional Headquarters to tell us a little bit about, he says, putting ensembles to work. Somebody's <laughs> got to put them to work. The National Blend of Models and the Evolution of Forecasting in the National Weather Service. Um, the next webinar will be sometime in mid-November, aiming for November 21st around 2 p.m. as usual. We'll have Tina Chow from UC Berkeley talking about boundary layer turbulence and complex terrain in general and possibly something about her immersed boundary condition model. We, we have to work out the details a little bit. Um, Tina, I see you're on, I think, and hope you don't mind that I just grabbed this image off your website. For those of you who may, it looks like most people are connected to the audio. If you're not, you probably can't hear this, so this won't help, but you can click the join audio that will bring up this box where you can either use computer audio or dial in a phone number and enter this participant ID when it asks for it. Um, this, record, this webinar will be recorded and we'll get it up on the website. I realize the last one still is not up on the website. We've been switching uh, meeting systems and switching, trying to switch up how we're hosting the videos. So it's taken a little bit longer than expected, but those, the last one and this one will both be up on the website. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt Juglum. We'll, talk, we'll let him talk for about 45 minutes, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, you'll be able to unmute yourself at that point. I'll change it so you can click down here and unmute yourself if you want to ask a question, or you should be able to type in the chat box if you click on the chat there. I'll be watching that if you, for some reason you can't get the audio to work or would just rather have listened to me ask your question for you. So with that, Matt, do you want to take it away? Sure. Uh, just in the right places here. Okay, how's that look? Can you see the title slide? That looks good to me. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Matt Jeglum, and my position is a research meteorologist at the Science and Technology and Fusion Division at Western Region Headquarters. So. Basically what that means is each region of the West, uh, National Weather Service, there's five in the continental U.S., has a group of people that are specifically charged with kind of doing research and development. And some of that research is in-house, but m much of it is, since our groups are small, is, you know, fostering research from elsewhere and bringing it into a place where National Weather Service operational forecasters can actually use it for making forecasts. Now, while my primary role is as a research meteorologist, let's see if I can get this slide to advance here. Um, I do get to actually go out and make sure that I'm not a hypocrite, because um, when I'm advocating for people, meteorologists in the field, to be using something, I better darn well be using it myself. And so here's some pictures right here from my uh, a wildfire in central Idaho that I was, I was just on for two weeks, ending two days ago. Um, and I was in the role of an incident meteorologist, and for those of you, you who don't know, it's basically um, a position that National Weather Service, a subset of, of National Weather Service forecasters perform where when a, you know, management team gets dispatched to a, a large wildfire, a forecaster is dispatched with them to provide on-site forecasting. And it's, it's a very fun, stressful, rewarding job because oftentimes, you know, you get very immediate feedback on something like a wind forecast where you issue it in the morning and then, you know, at some point in the afternoon you might get somebody walking into your tent saying, you know, what the bleep happened with that wind forecast. And so, um, so it's very fun and I have this meteogram down at the bottom of just the 30 Celsius diurnal ranges we were observing um, at the station that we had installed for the sake of the fire. Though so you could prefer imperial units, it was you know high of 88, low of 35 um, at the camp where most firefighters were staying. So it was um, it was quite a bit of interesting weather. But I'll kind of segue with that into you know so what matters most you know when you're forecasting on a fire you know this this idea of of, of not just kind of making a forecast and throwing it out to the world and saying here you know do with it what you will, which was kind of the the pathway that the weather service operated you know it's 
in the last 10 years, things have very much transitioned to this idea of doing DSS or decision decision support services, where the forecaster is very much involved in the communication, and that is a high priority in the forecast process. So it's not just you know we make our grids and we press send and good luck. It's very much of being proactive with building relationships with different partners, which might be a DOT, a national park, a city, a county, um, BLM, Forest Service, you name it. Um, those partners, we are proactive in developing relationships such that when there is weather that's coming, you know, we provide specific tailored, you know, email briefings, uh, webinars, uh, whatever it might be, spot weather forecast um, for these partners. And so on fires, you know, what do they want to know? Well, you want to know low RH during the day, high RH at night, how windy is it going to be, how unstable is the atmosphere going to be, so the potential for developing a plume-dominated fire. Um, wherever the smoke go, you know, that has numerous implications, you know, seeing the fire, operating aircraft, public health. Uh, then, you know, what's the potential for thunder or, you know, convection because, you know, that can produce gusty outflow winds that, can cause major issues for fire behavior, fire safety, firefighter safety, aviation operations are definitely impacted by thunder, um, or even just creating new fire starts in the area. You know, and all these things are, are things that the customers that are, get, are getting this information are comfortable with the idea of getting a range or a probability of something happening, and and historically we haven't really provided them as an provided that to them as an agency, um, and we can really improve all of these these different, you know, forecast variables, you know, I think without even improving the models at all from just the models we have right now, there is, you know, dramatic improvements in forecast scale that we can make, and we'll talk about that going forward. Um, so here's a little bit of background for those of you who aren't familiar. You know, forecast offices all issue what's called an area forecast discussion, and it's essentially the forecaster detailing their forecast process. Some go into a lot of detail, some don't go into much, but I use this to kind of illustrate the transition that we want to make. So here's an excerpt from a western region of the Weather Service Forecast Office at the top. It says the 12 ZGFS stays relatively dry through Tuesday, but the Euro has patchy precipitation during the entire extended forecast. Therefore, there is quite a bit of uncertainty in the extended precipitation through Wednesday. And this is a common um, uh, way of thinking amongst operational forecast staff. You know, but it's essentially looking at two deterministic models and using that to characterize uncertainty and the extent. And this is something that, you know, 20 or 25 years ago, you know, that's kind of all you had. Um, but nowadays, you know, this is this, we call it the GFS and EC forecasting is, is something that we really need to transition out of as an agency. Um, you know, number two, it says the GFS aims it directly at the blank. I removed the geographic identification information so to protect the guilty. While the Euro and the NAM push it slightly further northward. For now, we'll continue to side with the Euro slash NAM and the current forecast reflects this. You know, so, so sometimes a forecaster might conclude, well, you know, they're disagreeing and so I don't know what's going to happen. But in other cases, they say, well, you know, my intuition says this model is going to be right. And so I'm going to put all my chips on that side and just go for it. You know, and in, in many cases, or in some cases, the forecast might actually pan out but you don't know if you were lucky or if you were smart. Oftentimes, we're just lucky. Now, what we want to transition to is more of this one on this third bullet. Um, it says, by Thursday evening, these subtropical moisture overspreads the region, and NAFE's mean precipital water amounts reach the 99th percentile. So here, the forecaster uses a multi-ensemble system, the NAFE's, and also uses a tool that puts that forecast, that ensemble forecast, which, you know, out in long time ranges, you know, at, and very low resolutions, global ensembles often can give information that you'd never want to take literally. So putting it into a climatological context can really help elucidate, like, is this actually an abnormal forecast or not? You know, a 20-mile-an-hour forecast for a surface wind in, in a GFS ensemble member might be the highest it's ever forecast at a given location. Um, so we really want to go from this, you know, using a couple models, a lot of subjectivity, a lot of hunches, into making both guidance and the tools of you that guidance that really let us interrogate all of the information that we have. You know, the, the National Blend of Models, which we'll talk about later, has 162 individual um, forecast members in it. 
Um, and the human cannot possibly ascertain all the information in such a large body of guidance. So we need something to do it for us. You know, and, and really this is, you know, we just have to change. We've got more and better deterministic guidance, better and bigger ensembles. The post-processing methods that we have available are increasingly good. Um, we have people who, we have partners, you know, people who we provide decision support to who have, who have increasing expectations of what can be provided. You know, some of them might also have a private sector contractor that they deal with. Um, and they say, hey, we get this from our private sector guy, you know, what, do, what can you guys do? You know, so there's pressure there to really up the game. You know, uh, social media is really revolutionizing the way that forecasts can be communicated to both partners and the public. And really, you know, we have the tools to be able to say, you know, if somebody comes to us and says, what's the likelihood of 35 mile an hour gust at this location on the, for day six? You know, today the forecaster is going to kind of go in there and say, well, you know, look at a couple models, kind of, you know, put together their secret sauce. And there's a few tools that, you know, objective tools that can be used. But really, if there's a lot of subjectivity in the process, it's probably going to take quite a while to interrogate all everything you need to know. And, and really, the future is going to be, you know, something that assimilates all the information available, post-processes it, and puts it in an easy-to-use tool that says, you need to know the probability of that that wind speed at, at that location at that time, okay, give me 30 seconds. I'll give it to you. So here's kind of an a overview slide of what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the presentation. You know, so the, the ultimate goal, and actually quick sidebar, you know, what I'm going to talk about in this presentation, there's a combination of three things. One is things that the Weather Service is doing. Two, things that the Weather Service will be doing soon. and Three things that the Weather Service should be doing. Now, that's a little bit, there's a little bit of, you know, opining that's going to happen on number three there. And, and I'm obviously biased towards what is going on out here in Western region, which is really where all the complex terrain is, which is why um, it's appropriate for a venue such as the Mountain Meteorology webinar series. But you talk to somebody in Eastern region, you talk to somebody at National Weather Service headquarters in DC, they might say something slightly different, but I would hope that in general the big themes would be consistent. Just a little caveat there. But really, okay, so the ultimate goal is that we want to produce calibrated probabilistic forecasts that allow the National Weather Service to provide decision support for weather impacts with climatological context. So those of you who don't know the difference between a weather hazard and a weather impact, a weather hazard is a major flood. So, you know, say 35 feet on this USGS gate, you know, river gauge. Now, an impact would be three feet of water at this intersection. You know, so that's, and that's a big step, one that the Weather Service generally hasn't been um, involved in too much historically, in part just because of technological limitations. But, you know, a lot of partners, you know, it's, it's not really, it's not nearly as useful to say the river stage is going to be this as it is to give them a map that shows here's the, in, here are the areas that will be inundated based on our forecast, you know, and, and ideally it would be some sort of probabilistic, you know, here's the, here's the, you know, the, for the median forecast, here's what you're, here's what you're going to see for inundation, stuff like that. But to get to this goal, this, you know, and, and right now we're not doing probabilistic forecasts. Our, our, the fundamental backbone of the Weather Service forecast is the NDFD, which is deterministic. So there's, you know, that's going to take time to change. Um, we've got calibrated forecast products, but they aren't necessarily the core of what we use. Providing decision support is something that is very much a core function of weather service offices. was not necessarily the case 10 or 15 years ago or even five years ago in some offices, but that has very much been adopted. And this whole impacts and climatological context are also things that are being worked towards, sometimes awkwardly, sometimes a little bit of, you know, two steps forward, one step back. But we're getting there. So to reach this goal, there's, I, I kind of look at it, we kind of look at it here as an SDID. Is there's, being, there's four steps. Step one is you need to produce high-quality post-processed ensemble data. So this includes, you know, the ensembles themselves, reforecast and reanalyses that can use for, be used for the post-processing, the best post-processing techniques that science can give us, as well as gridded mesoscale analyses, because in many cases in the West, you know, if you have analysis at 13 kilometers for a given field, good luck at 
doing a good job making forecasts in, in many areas. Um, so we need high resolution but scale analyses. You know, in some cases we have good ones, in some cases we have passable ones, sometimes in some cases we have nothing when it comes to analyses. But if you're going to do good post processing, a lot of times you're going to need a good analysis. Number two, tools to visualize and interpret this ensemble output. So you can have the best, you know, post process ensemble data in the world, but if there isn't a way that the operational forecaster can take that, interrogate it, and then communicate it, you're not, it's, it might as well be useless. So we need something ideally cloud-based um, that interfaces very easily with GIS because a lot of our partners are GIS, totally GIS-based. You know, you go to most state EOCs and they're going to want stuff that they can put into our GIS. Uh, number three, we need forecasters fluent in interpreting and communicating this ensemble output. So you can have a, a you can have great guidance, you can have a great tool that visualizes it, but if you don't have a forecaster, the person that's actually going to do the communicating and, and do the decision support that understands the concepts, understands what a, a various probabilistic, um, you know, statistical concepts mean, then again, the whole the whole system breaks down. And number four, also critical, is you need public and partners with the ability to apply this probabilistic information to decision making. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you have the guidance, the tool, and the forecaster that is communicating it perfectly. If you have the partner that doesn't actually understand what you're saying, then it also falls apart because ultimately the value that's produced out of a weather forecast is the person that makes the decision that either saves lives, you know, enhances economic productivity, preserves um, you know, property from being damaged, all these different things. So these four, these four steps, you know, the Weather Service is in various degrees of progress on all of these. And, you know, if you ask different people, they will have different opinions on which ones we're doing well on, which ones we're not. But we need to address all four and we're going to do well. And, and I have to give the agency credit that I think, you know, even though we could be doing a lot more, I think they've done a pretty good job of identifying and starting to provide solutions to every one of these four steps in some capacity. Okay, so this is an excerpt from the um, latest strategic plan from the Weather Service that was released this year. Um, there's a lot of things in it, but I want to just highlight specifically the purposes of this talk what is in the red box, which I added. So I added the red box, and it says, you know, and you know, keep in mind that this is I, this excerpt is what's changing in the strategic plan. And so this is what's important is, you know, it's not like, you know, words on paper on strategic plans don't necessarily mean anything. And I think anybody that's worked in the corporate world or been in that, you know, kind of environment knows that just because it's on paper doesn't mean it matters. But if it's on paper, you know, and you can refer back to it when you're trying to push something through or do an initiative or build some sort of tech piece of technology, it can really help. So here in the Weather Service, something that has changed since our previous strategic plan is ensemble modeling will improve the accuracy and lead time of our forecast and enable better, better quantification of forecast confidence. That is a step forward. A blend of models will provide a consistent starting point for NWS forecast operations. One of the biggest issues in the agency historically has been that every forecast office, all 120 some of them, do it differently. Some of them do it very differently from their neighbor and from the guy on the other side of the country. So having some sort of ensemble blend, which in this case is most likely going to be the National Blended Models, is really important to make a consistent starting point for everybody CONUS-wide. Then also integrating the power of human skill with the efficiency of new computing technology will revolutionize hazard forecasting enabled by machine learning and advanced probabilistic tools. So this really addresses a couple of those steps I talked about earlier. So you know that's great that it's in the strategic plan. But, you know, you got to get from strategy to tactics to really like the forecaster on the desk. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that, that moving things down that, that ladder on the next few slides. Okay, so what are some short, what is a short list of steps the Weather Service is currently taking to meet this goal? One is the National Blended Models, and so I'm going to talk about that uh, more extensively later on. That's intended to be the forecast database of the future that is a calibrated ensemble-based um, forecast database. Two is emphasizing decision support skills both in training and hiring. 
And universities can help a lot there, but I'll talk about that later. Um, you know, historically, it was very much, you know, the, the weather nerd was what was valued. And to some people's chagrin, to some people's, you know, delight, the Weather Service is changing the kind of demographic or the skill set that it's looking for when hiring. And a lot of times it's, you know, not so much pure, you know, meteorological know-how and forecasting prowess, but also ability to, you know, be an effective communicator, both, you know, in written, oral, and in-person interactions, um, among other things. And then uh, number three is developing a web-based viewing platform for ensemble data. And that's the kind of thing where, for those of you who are familiar, you know, the, the Weather Service has been very much based on this um, system called AWIPS, which is, you know, a, kind of a standalone computer that visualizes weather data and, um, you know, NOAA itself, so, you know, Weather Service is part of NOAA. NOAA has a pretty big um, uh, push into cloud computing and, and big data and, and utilizing third-party vendors, including things like Amazon Web Services, to, to host data and, and crunch numbers. The Weather Service is definitely lagging behind NOAA on that, but it's certainly on the radar. And, and developing this, you know, web-based platform is kind of a step from kind of this AWIPS, very, you know, local, um, you, know, you got to replicate the same system in every office nationwide to moving to something web-based and hopefully eventually something that's cloud-based where people are just pulling data as needed from the cloud. And so in Western region in particular, um, so what are we doing here? Well, one thing is grassroots culture change. As my old boss used to say, uh, science is easy, but people are hard. And when you're talking about transitioning from this GFS and EC, heavily uh, subjective forecast process, and um, just kind of for reference, in the last, I think since May, I've been able to go to 11 different forecast offices, 11 of the 24 forecast offices in the Western United States, as well as having conversations with about, one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with about 50 individual weather service forecasters and in groups, probably a grand total of about 80 weather service forecasters. So I got a really good cross-section in the last several months of kind of the different forecast processes that people are using. And, and you know, there's, there's definitely a um, culture shift that needs to happen from this GFS and EC to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust the calibrated post-process ensemble guidance I'm giving and then identify the um, targets of opportunity where the human, like both human intuition and the human critical thinking skills can really add value to that um, kind of automated guidance. But this is a huge culture change. And um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but there's this kind of relatively famous paper in the Weather Service. It was written by a man named Len Snellman. It was in BAMS in 1977 where he referred to what, was what he called meteorological cancer. The meteorological cancer was the, um, he was, the paper discussed how um, model output statistics or MOS was starting to take over the, um, the forecast from the human and that we were at risk of the human basically doing nothing but issuing MOS as their forecast and not thinking critically about it and that causing the forecaster to basically lose their own ability to critically think about the weather and just become a button pusher that sends out MOS. Now, in this day and age, it's kind of funny to think back that people actually thought that automated guidance was going to take over in 1977, considering that even today, there's a debate over whether automated guidance should take over. But through the years, starting in 1977, and then, you know, Glenn Selman in 77, and Chuck Doswell wrote a couple papers in the 80s. Um, Lance Bosart wrote at least one, I think, in the 90s. There was numerous people that all the way from 1977 to the early 80s, to the late 80s, to the early 90s, to the late 90s, to the early 2000s, to the late 2000s, have written papers published in AMS journals. I think um, maybe even some folks in the mountain meteorology community, maybe I think Cliff wrote one, you know, we're basically discussing this idea of like, is the computer going to finally take over, you know, and is that a good thing? And, you know, this is a culture change, you know, this is a culture change that still has yet to fully happen inside the weather service of this, we can trust the automated guidance and we should look simply for targets of opportunity where the human can add value, um, you know, which are increasingly going to be at the short time ranges 
for high impact weather. So that's a big thing. And, you know, I kind of like this cartoon here. Um, it's from XKCD, for those of you who are familiar with it, and it says, you know, we wouldn't have all these problems if people just learned to be more logical and science-driven instead of relying on feelings. And another person replies, well, oh, what study are you basing that on? Well, it just seems obvious. I mean, look at the crap that these idiots believe. You know, I think the uh, writer for XKCD uh, wrote this, you know, specifically with politics in mind, but I think it fits here where, um, you know, somebody who works in R&D, I like to think that, you know, the objective, this thing has a better skill score, so you could you should use it, is, you know, is all that's necessary to convince a forecaster to change. And unfortunately, that is, is absolutely not the case. Um, and in some cases, the forecaster is a very legitimate argument that, you know, just because some the equitable threat score of a certain QPF forecast is better than this one does not mean that that product provides a better basis for doing decision support when you're talking to the operations manager at a Department of Transportation about whether they should put all their snowplow drivers on overtime tonight. You know, um, you know, skill scores aren't everything, even though skill scores are really important. But it's I kind of like this idea of like there's a huge amount of soft skills and just culture change where, you know, the the scientific part is is sometimes the easier part and just getting shifting a culture is 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 much much harder oftentimes. But we're working on that. That's why part of why we've been visiting all of our offices. Okay. So number two is also integrating whatever ensemble tools we can into the forecast process now. Like I said, you know, the stuff I'm talking about right now, some of it has happened, some of it will happen, some of it should happen. And, and we're kind of in a really awkward, we're kind of like in the teenage years right now when it comes to this integration of, of ensemble forecasts into weather service operations, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's pimply, it's skinny, it's a little bit misshapen and, and awkward, but we're doing, I think, basically we're doing what we think is going to be best the most beneficial thing to move the agency forward through whatever means we can. Um, and some of these means are third-party sites. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with Tropical Tidbits, Weather Bell, and other things. I'll talk more about those. Um, something like the High Resolution Ensemble Forecast. Um, we can make poor man's ensembles in AWIPS or what we call the Forecast Confidence Toolkit. So what are some uh, examples of these things? Okay. I have, I think, like five. So here's one. You know, how are we trying to kind of in this awkward transition phase of getting from this, you know, forecast based on a deterministic, gridded, um, subjectively edited forecast to something where we are, we identify targets of opportunity to improve an automated ensemble-based forecast. And here we go. Here's something that is from uh, SRO PSD. And what this tool is, is it's, it's really good kind of as a situational awareness tool, and it takes the guest forecast, the GFS ensemble, it looks at surface wind, surface precipitation, and surface temperature, and it puts it into a percentile based on previous forecasts. So, like, how does this forecast rank compared to forecasts, um, compared to the, the GFS ensemble reforecast data set? And you can see here, you know, the, you know, these uh, big green dots up in northeastern Oregon correspond to a precipitation percentile forecast in the 99th or higher. So that's definitely something where it's like, if you're looking at this, you're forecasting, you're saying, and you're in Pendleton, the Pendleton forecast office say, hey, we've got a very anomalous, you know, uh, precipitation forecast in this. We should dig into this and look at what kind of precipitation amounts we're saying there because the ensemble tool is really highlighting this as something that is a uh, target of opportunity. Okay, another one. Uh, this was developed here in Western Region. For those of you who know Trevor Alcott, he worked a lot on this. It's a, the situational awareness table, and what it does is it also takes the GFS ensemble, and it takes any number of fields, mostly upper-level fields, but also precipitable water, IVT, stuff like that, and puts it into a climatological context based on the climate forecast system reanalysis. So what this chart, this table on the left basically shows you is for a three-week period centered on this day, what is the recurrence interval of the values in the current forecast? And so anything dark red is 
outside the CFSR climate. So this has not this value has not been observed in previous forecasts um, in this three-week period. And you can see what this actual plot on the right shows in that outside CFSR climate bright red color is the precipitable water um, signature associated with Tropical Storm Evo making its way north um, along the Baja California coast. Now, it doesn't look like it's going to make its way in the western U.S., but you know, this is the kind of thing that can be useful when you're trying to say, like, hey, this is tropical storm out there. What kind of, you know, precipitable water matters to us as an indicator for potential high-impact weather? You can check here and see how anomalous <coughs> are the values. Um, the CW3E group down at Scripps in San Diego um, has some useful atmospheric river tools. This tool in particular basically looks at the GFS ensemble as well, and it gives you a pr probability of a certain integrated vapor transport value for a given um, forecast projection and a given latitude. So this can be really useful if you're just looking at, hey, you know, I, you know, especially for our forecasters who are used to looking at the GFS and the EC and making their decisions, one of them might look at the GFS and say, whoa, there's a big atmospheric river making landfall over, you know, Southern California in this GFS run. I wonder if, you know, if it's just going to switch soon or if the ensemble actually is consistent with the signal. Well, you can go to this tool and you can like and say, oh, man, you know, the GFS ensemble has a 100% probability of, you know, this level of integrated vapor transport making its way on onshore at this location. Uh, so I don't know if anybody's familiar with WeatherBell. It's a private company. You have to hold your nose regarding some aspects of um, what they do. But the one benefit they have is a paid site. Uh, but the one thing that they do have is the full resolution version of the European Ensemble. Um, and they've got some cool visualizations for it. The one I'm showing is for peak wind gusts. And this matrix in the top half basically shows you all 50 European Ensemble members all the way out through the 15-day period. Um, you know, so every six-hour period for every individual ensemble member is color-coded by the peak gusts that the ensemble, that ensemble member is producing. And then on the bottom uh, panel is basically the average um, gust in miles per hour. And this one can be really useful, especially when you're walking something in from, say, day eight. You know, it's like you might, you know, in this case, there was a pretty windy period associated with the trough passage. This is a station on the east slope of the not, uh, of the Rockies in Montana, and you can see the the system that was coming through at about five days lead time um, was pretty consistent. You can see that most ensemble members had a relatively high gust forecast over a roughly 24-hour period. And then you walked out further in time. Once you got out to about 10 days, you could see that there was definitely ensemble members that had high gust forecasts. But since there was no kind of vertical bar, you know, there was very little on member to member consistency on if and when that high wind event might happen. So this can be really useful. If you can look at these plots for QPF, for wind, for temps, uh, precipitable water, uh, cloud cover, cape. Um, and you can kind of walk in from, from long lead times, potential high impact weather events. Now, everything I've talked about so far is kind of you know, looking at like bulk scale, walking stuff in at, at uh, from long time ranges and getting a little bit more specific in time and space. We have the high, res high resolution ensemble forecast. You know, that's run at, um, at EMC, but I think SPC also has a, their own little bit customized version. Um, but what this is showing is that SPC has a web tool where you can visualize HREF output. And HREF is 10 ensemble members. It's um, the HER, the WARF NSSL, the WARF ARW, the WARF NMMB, and the NAMNES. So five cloud resolving models and one time lag version of each, so 10 total, that's used. For, you know, I think all of those are at three kilometers or roughly three kilometers. And they have visualizations where you can look at. So this is joint probability for fire weather of RH less than 20%, wind speed greater than 15%. Um, and it color codes it by the probability of that joint probability, um, those, those two um, elements happening. And so this can be very 
uh, useful for any number of things, convective, fire, winter, severe, uh, high impact weather. Uh, there's also the HER ensemble, which is similar. It's, uh, I think, nine members plus the deterministic run. I can't remember for sure. Um, but it also offers similar um, output on, you know, short time ranges at high resolution, um, probabilistic output for different fields. It used to be just over the eastern United States. Now it expanded to the full CONUS. And here's another tool that's not necessarily an ensemble tool in the strict sense, but it's an example of kind of trying to integrate um, this, what we talked about with like impacts, not just forecasting hazards, but impacts. And what this does is, so, well, backing up a little bit, so USGS, after a major wildfire, will go out and they will, um, I think using both remote sensing and on the ground analysis, they will develop um, debris flow thresholds for um, wildfire burn scars on a basin by basin basis. So I think that's why they use some satellite data to do it as well as, um, you know, some in-situ stuff. But we can pull that data. So basically those debris flow thresholds and those thresholds are, you know, amount of precipitation per time. And we can uh, take the HER forecast and in a um, graphical situation like you see here, we have the last six forecasts from the HER in this box in the upper right. And then we color code the um, fire area by, you know, each of the, you can see each of the drainages in this particular fire are highlighted in different colors based on the threat of um, the HER producing a certain precipitation rate within a certain radius of the fire. And that is then applied to each of the basins in that fire scar to basically give a likelihood of debris flow based on the HER forecast. And you can kind of see in the, in, the, in the matrix in the upper right what the peak likelihood of debris flow is for each different HER run um, for the, the, the last six runs. So this is kind of one of our kind of initial attempts to really start to get to the impacts, not just the hazards, using the, the uh, tools that we have. <clears throat> now, there's other tools, you know, like I think um, some of the uh, forecast offices in the Pacific Northwest are using some of the ensemble tools that Cliff's group is running up there at UW. And, um, you know, I think there's other groups around the nation that are um, more regionally based, but that's kind of an overview of things that we're using. And so now I want to get to the NBM. So the great thing about all, like all those previous tools are great, but one of the things that we really want to do is put it all together so that we actually have something that is ensemble based, but um, you know, 500, knowing what the climatological, you know, percentile of 500 millibar height fields is, can be useful, but that's not what kills anybody, right? Really, we want to know ultimately what we want a calibrated post-process ensemble based surface forecast for important variables like wire weather, RH, wind speeds, QPF, um, even things like, uh, you know, ceiling sky cover, stuff like that, you know, if you're on, if you're in LA and you're, uh, you work, you know, in aviation, like you really care what the ceiling height or the sky cover is for LAX on a given day, even if the weather otherwise is very benign. So those are the kind of things that we really have no tool that takes an ensemble calibrated look at what is the stratus extent going to be in Southern California on, you know, this given day. So the MBM is, is, making strides towards providing a forecast data set that doesn't require lots of intuition or um, hedging or isn't just kind of a broad brush on, you know, situation awareness tool, but actually gives the forecaster a calibrated probabilistic forecast of the things that matter on the surface. And right now it has 162 individual inputs that includes six ensemble systems, seven uh, cloud resolving models. Um, it has pretty advanced post processing for some fields, um, primarily QPF and POP. Other things are relatively simple, like for temperatures, winds. It's it's simply a you know dynamically weighted, um, uh, uh, dynamically weighted uh, forecast based on its performance relative to the IRMA analysis. Uh, you know, we've got peak type, snow ratio. There's a ton of fields coming out of this because uh, the MBM is charged with providing uh, forecast 
like ensemble-based forecast data to every program in the National Weather Service. So that includes, you know, uh, marine, fire, uh, severe, all these different things. And some of it's very basic, some of it's fairly advanced. I'll talk about some of it. Um, so what kind of probabilistic is coming out with the current, oper current experimental version of the MBM? Well, there's MAX-T, MIN-T. Those were supposed to be a little more robust. They had to scale it back to just kind of mean and spread. Uh, QPF6, QPF24, a bunch of different snow, ice, thunder, the probability of snow, ice, and freezing rain, and there's a lot more coming in version 4.0, uh, which is going to be, I think, in a year or a year and a half, or like a year and a half or so from now. Um, this is kind of a question mark. So for the, the QPF and the pot from the MBM, um, this is an example of kind of the necessity of, you know, a lot of those tools I showed earlier are, are kind of, especially the weather belt tool, is, is kind of looking at a raw ensemble conception of things. And, you know, you can definitely take the EC ensemble in its raw form much more literally than you can take the GFS ensemble due to its um, uh, higher resolution, among other things. Here's kind of an illustration of, of what you really, why you really need to get that post-processed part in there. You see in the upper left plot here, you know, the raw NSEP ensemble, really poor skill, very unreliable. And, uh, you know, so this is for just basically one day forecast of, of probability precipitation. The middle plot on the top row is the Canadian ensemble. It's quite a bit better by skill score and quite a bit more reliable, but still not particularly good on either of those. On the right, you combine the two and you actually get something that's worse than a Canadian, but better than NSEP. Now what the MBM, QPF, and POP uh, post-processing does, it's a, basically the, the core of it is a quantile mapping technique. And basically all that is, for anybody who doesn't know, is that you take the cumulative distribution function of your observations, the cumulative distribution function of your forecast, so let's say you have a half an inch forecast, um, and that corresponds to a 75th percentile in the forecast CDF. Basically, you map that 75th percentile up to your observed um, CDF. So say in the observed CDF, 75th percentile is one inch. And so that one inch value becomes your new forecast value, um, your quantile map forecast value. So when you quantile map these ensemble data, you get a much, much better skill and much, much more reliable forecast. Um, I won't belabor the next few points, but you know, we add one more step to each of the other three boxes on the lower row to the point we get to the lower right where we have a quite skillful pop forecast that's extremely reliable. And so this is the kind of thing where, you know, we want to leverage ensembles, but we want to leverage ensembles in an intelligent way where we apply the best post processing using the best possible analyses to get a, um, a really good forecast. Okay, so probability of weather types. So I don't know if Heather's on the, on the call, but Heather Reeves and uh, some of her colleagues down at NSSL have done some really good work on um, making a better algorithm for uh, producing probability of weather type, which I feel like it's kind of underrated um, in a lot of cases. You know, it's, it's really fun to focus on QPF, getting good QPF forecasts or various things, but making a good what precipitation type is going to fall at the surface forecast is extremely important for operational forecasters. You know, it's kind of funny how much effort we put into getting a really good QPF forecast, but so often in the winter, you know, our good QPF forecast doesn't matter if our precip type is totally off. And, um, you know, I don't need to convince anybody here that that can be an especially difficult task in the West. Well, it's difficult in the East too, but in the West, it's not necessarily easy when you have rain versus snow or the potential for cold air pools producing some um, mixed precipitation. But this is one example of kind of, in addition to the last, the QPF stuff I just talked about was largely out of Tom Hamill's group at, um, in Boulder. And this is some uh, technology that we've brought in from NSSL. It's not incorporated yet, but it's going to be incorporated in the next version of the MBM to really do a much better job of using a layer energy approach, you know, taking every single individual model sounding that the MBM is, is utilizing, weighting them based on the quality of that sounding and the um, resolution of the model that's using it, 
and then really coming up with a robust precipitation type forecast and a probabilistic um, one at that. Okay, uh, so one of the last slides here. So, you know, the MBM right now, like I said, it's kind of, it's come a really long way from where it started, but it could go a lot further with the right science integrated in. And so far, you know, the Weather Service in-house, especially MDL, which is where the uh, MBM is being developed, really doesn't have the in-house expertise to be able to make it state of the science for all the fields they're charged with producing. And so that's why it's really the kind of thing that this whole process, um, not just the MBM, but this shift of the, of the, of the weather forecast of the weather service to having this, um, uh, you know, providing DSS through having really good post-process ensemble-based data sets is, is going to really take like the whole weather enterprise, you know, academia, like NOAA OAR, folks at NCAR uh, and others, you know, are, are, it's really necessary. Um, you know, and it's especially for me coming out of the more academic side and then getting into the weather service, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, the, the sexy topics to get worked on, but the stuff that's actually really important for the operational forecaster that gets no attention, you know, things like um, having good forecasts for coastal shadow so this and just looking at a single deterministic model that you have that runs up to 36 hours or mixing height for, you know, prescribed burning and wildfires and public health, um, wave height, things like that, even high winds, you know, and, and a lot of these things, you know, like both the post-processing techniques to, to, to operate on them as well as the analyses necessary to do the post-processing you know, are, there's ample opportunities for these things to be improved. Um, the observational networks that go into, you know, I have this, uh, this kind of uh, third bullet down, you know, it's like the observational networks that can feed into the analyses, which can then feed the post-processing, which that can then feed these indices like the hot, dry, windy, or the Hanes, which needs to be replaced, um, that can really help highlight hazardous weather or just provide, like, really good probabilistic forecast of, Instead of me being on a fire as an instant meteorologist and kind of making up a relative minimum relative humidity range based on the few things I have available to me at that time frame and resolution, you know, something that actually outputs to me a robust calibrated like interquartile range of here's the here's the RHs you can expect today. Like we don't really have anything that can do that in the weather service or to my knowledge operationally anywhere else. Um, we definitely need reforecasting reanalyses um, in addition to the basic model development. Um, but then, of course, there is just the the basic kind of development of of the, of the models, which is getting plenty of press these days. Um, the last few bullets, I think, are, are are really critical. You know, the social science aspect is really important. If you remember those three bullets I mentioned initially, uh, or, four, or four, sorry, four steps initially. It was, you know, we need the we need the guidance, we need the, the visualization tools, we need the forecaster that can interpret it, and we need the public that can understand it. You know, the social social science is really critical for those last two of the forecaster interpretation and the public understanding. And there's quite a bit of good social science science that's been done. Um, you know, there's some being done at UW, there's some being done at NCAR, some being done at other places as well. Um, but, you know, going back to that kind of cartoon I put where it's, you know, we like to think that, like, well, this is obviously, you know, this is the best skill, so this is what we need to use. It's like, well, do we really know that that's the best way to actually communicate these forecasts um, to, the, uh, to the end user? And the last thing is educating meteorologists in these concepts from the beginning. So this is an interesting one. This is, the, sorry, I think this is my last slide, so if anybody's getting tired, um, don't worry, we're almost there. Uh, and... I, you know, going to all these weather forecast offices and talking to a lot of kind of new forecasters, people who've been in the agency for five years or less, it's been really surprising to me. You know, they definitely complain about not being trained by the agency to do what we're asking them to do, and they are fully justified in saying that. But the one thing that's, that's been interesting is that, you know, I feel like this is the way the world is going, not just the weather service. You know, the world's going this way. Some private companies have, are, like, long committed to this path of, of you know, providing probabilistic uh, guidance and um, integrating uh, ensembles into their forecast process. But it's been surprising to me how few students I talk to have come out of their undergraduate or even graduate programs at prominent 
atmospheric science programs without really having had any education in probabilistic forecasting or really being prepared whatsoever for this new paradigm that we're going into. You know, they're still kind of, many of them have been trained up kind of in a deterministic forecast, beat the models, beat your friends, you know, maximum skill score. And, um, and obviously high skill scores are important, but, you know, really kind of bringing the next generation up through the whole process from, you know, undergrad to grad school to our training and the weather service, um, really being focused on kind of this, what the future is going to look like and what tools are going to be used, I think is a, something that really needs uh, well, renovation, for lack of a better term. And I would hope that people, those of you who are at universities, would be able to encourage me by saying that that's what we're doing, Matt. Don't worry. It's not us. <laughs> Um, but that is an experience I've had. So that's it. I'm going to stop there. I think I've already gone about 45 to 50 minutes. So I'm glad to answer any questions anybody has. Great. Thank you, Matt. And you should all now be set up so that you can unmute yourselves if you have questions. Um, if this turns into a madhouse and you can't manage to take turns, I'll, I'll figure out a better way to do it. But for now, I think we're all civilized and we can manage this. Um, while the rest of you are thinking about this and what burning questions are jumping to mind and trying to find the unmute button in the bottom left, uh, I, I wanted to ask Matt uh, what you think about the issues with the resolution. So particularly thinking about uh, mountains, you mountains often don't show up very well in models with say a 50 kilometer resolution, which I, or I think 50 kilometer grid spacing was what GFS had at least initially. Um, is, is that something you've thought about much? Is that something you think you can manage purely with post-processing? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's definitely two ways to go about it. One, you can make the models high resolution or two, you can post-process the models to get, you know, a high resolution forecast. So those are obviously the two options. And, um, and I think that there's vast improvements we can make simply on the um, post-processing what we have now side. Um, now I'm not, I'm not a modeler. I'm not even necessarily an expert on post-processing. Um, I'm just somebody who I feel like is a jack of all trades who kind of knows something about the, the end user as well as the, the kind of research side. And, and a lot of that, I think that there's not nearly as much attention paid to getting, making good mesoscale analyses in complex terrain. You know, there's, if, if my brain, if I can go in and say, you know, this analysis, like if I can look at satellite and, you know, observations and various things and for something like, say, cloud cover, you know, we don't have an analysis that does any sort of decent job at analyzing, say, strat, coastal stratus. Um, and so, therefore, if you want to, post-process some, like make a post-process forecast for sky cover along the Pacific coast, you know, you're out of luck for that. And um, so, yeah, I, I think we should certainly keep pushing forward, you know, with plans to have something like, you know, I would sure hope that 20 years from now we have a 50 kilometer, uh, 50 member, three kilometer global cloud resolving ensemble that, you know, doesn't need nearly as much help as the current GFS ensemble does. But in the meantime, through improving the analyses that we have and the post-processing methods we use, um, I think we can make a lot of headway, um, even if the models don't improve. But, you know, you bring up a good point that, uh, you know, on this fire in particular, you know, I was, you know, we had our station situated in a place where really it was only representative of maybe, uh, you know, one kilometer area around it, you know, down in this kind of moist valley. And so, um, you know, there's certain there's certain uh, things that we're just not going to be able to do um, soon or maybe ever, but I think that there's a lot of room for improvement. You know, because really right now we're we're still kind of at a loss. You know, once you get past day three. Um, you know, and a lot of partners, you know, it's like they want good forecasts, but they also want a heads up, you know, like dam operators want to know if there's a big storm coming, you know, day two to day three, but also if there's another one on day seven to day nine, you know, and, and 
it'd be really good to be able to improve our ability to forecast something like a landfalling AR and precipitation amounts, even if it's really rough hewn, you know, on something like day seven. And I think our, you know, better analyses and post-processing can really help us to leverage the global ensembles that we have now. I don't know if everybody else is just shy or can't find the <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, that means Dale Duran. Yep, we can hear you. We, we could hear you. Can anybody else hear Dale? Yeah, I couldn't really get pick up anything. Something, something must be wrong with your microphone or maybe your computer is covered. Um, yeah, Dale, if you want to just type it into the chat window, I can read it out here. Um, I don't know if you can see David's question in the chat window. It um, just says, just curious with the NBM probabilistic grids, do you see all of those being adjusted toward the official forecast using CDFs like we currently do with probabilistic snow? How can we do this with limited computing in the short term? Where will we go with cloud computing and how soon can we make the appropriate shift of our resources? Um, for David's question, I think he's referring to um, the, so the, the current prob probabilistic snow that the forecast the Weather Service uses is, is there's a ensemble that WPC, WPC um, produces that basically produces a spread in QPF, and that is actually centered on, you know, so you basically you get like a PDF, but um, instead of it being centered on the actual value that came out of the ensemble, it is the spread is kind of applied to the. Uh, the uh, deterministic forecast that comes out of the forecast office. And so hopefully, David, I'm going to answer your question. Um, I would say that I don't see the MBM grids being adjusted towards the official forecast be just because I think that it's, you know, a very statistically poor way of doing things to kind of come up with a spread and then just apply it to kind of any number that a person chooses. And I think it's it's kind of been like a, a stopgap measure that's been better than what we've done in the past, but ultimately that's not the future. Um, and I think, you know, in the short term, like I kind of said, it's going to, we're kind of be in the teenage years of, of awkwardness where I, I've seen events where the MBM probabilistic snow forecast does extremely well, um, but others where it's, you know, the observed amount falls well outside of the actual, um, like, you know, 10th to 90th. Uh, so, um, so I guess that's, so for sake of time, I'll stop there. Feel free to email me, David, if you have more questions. Uh, I see there's a few questions coming in. Uh, so Dale has, uh, he's talking about forecast confidence, green, yellow, red indicator, seems to have disappeared, Andy, about the experience of other weather services and his basic indicator of ensemble confidence. Yeah, and that's something that definitely has been bouncing around the weather service. And some off, some forecast offices, again, going back to that, they can be very different. Some offices, I think, have really adopted the simple, we just have, like, green, yellow, red, and, you know, magenta for our color scale. And that's kind of how, how we really, one of our fundamental ways of communicating our forecasts and our confidence in it. Um, and so I'd say that there's been good experience with that in the weather service. It's kind of drifting as a, like, no one's really picked it up. It's like, this is the way we have to go as an agency fully. Um, I endorse it. Um, I know that some of the European weather agencies have been 
further along this track. I think the Canadians and the Australians are pretty similar to us in that they're kind of, they've been historically doing a kind of very, quite subjective deterministic forecast for a while, and they're kind of really starting to push similar to how the weather service is only recently more probabilistic. Um, so I, I guess my short answer is I don't really know for sure the answer to that question, but it's, it's something that has been adopted in pockets in the weather service. Um, and for the MBM mean against NDFD uh, question, um, so this is this is where things really get complicated because then you know it's kind of the existential question you know what is truth, and um, in some cases like, so the the IRMA analysis which is the official analysis for the National Weather Service the MBM is is um, solidly better across virtually the whole nation for most um, uh, for most uh, forecast projections is better than NDFD forecasts. But that is the IRMA analysis, and a lot of local forecast offices think that um, when they do their actual gridded analysis that a grid point with a station in it should exactly match that grid point, whereas the IRMA analysis is an objective analysis that, you know, it basically um, you know, adjusts a background field towards the observations, but does it in an objective way where you de do not necessarily get an observation that will match the analysis grid point. Um, and that is a huge stumbling block for a lot of people. They say, well, you know, you can say, hey, the MBM is being the NDFD. And they'll say, well, no, it's only being the NDFD for the data set that you're using, which is, you know, you know, you're basically rigging the deck against our NDFD forecast, and um, and I think in some cases it's a very legitimate argument where the IRMA does not necessarily do a good job at certain stations, and so when they say we're doing a better good, better job at you know providing forecasts that are good at this station, you know they're right, and so I'd say um, for that for that statement, you know the MBM is better than NDFD asterisk, um, but it depends on who you ask and what analysis or verification data set you use which is a continuing, it, it really comes back to the culture change and, and really just, you know, refocusing on what is, what do we really care about? What's the ultimate goal? Um, and then Justin says with the SBC method, um, the plan to run this scheme in a deterministic sense on each ensemble member. Um, and so I think what, so this is still a question mark, but I think what it would basically do is that we would use, we'd run it on each ensemble member and then essentially produce a deterministic forecast from each ensemble member and then develop the, um, prob the probabilistic aspect of it from all the different ensemble members that exist because I think you can output from a single sounding a, a probabilistic forecast. Uh, but I could be confusing my different um, p-type methods there. So uh, hopefully, let's see. Yeah, I, I think just in the short answer is that each each member sounding will produce a deterministic p-type that will then be used to you know the raw ensemble likelihood will be used to make the probabilistic forecast. Um, and feel free to jump in, Ethan, if we need to cut it for time. I'm just going to go through these chats. Let's see, there's just one more. And people can uh, jump off if they need to, but I think we can go through a couple more here. We started a little bit late. Thanks. Okay. Um, and this is, how well does the MBM handle extreme events, especially in context, complex terrain? I've been doing verification MBM in three locations across California for two years. Find this very well for the first 60 hours, but not so well for extreme events, routinely, but not so well for extreme events. Um, yeah, and so this is the this is you know for QPF, you know essentially my conclusion with QPF is that you can basically come to whatever answer you want with QPF based on the verification score, time frame, and um, you can basically like what you can design a, a verification study to get whatever conclusion you want because there's so many different ways to th slice and dice QPF skill. And one of the important ones, and I think that the short answer would be the MBM QPF, at least this is what 
Um, seems like this what that question was specifically uh, was about heavy precip is the MBM is is doing a really good job at kind of like bulk verification statistics. And I think in terms of extreme events, it is more hit and miss like virtually any guidance is going to be where um, it tends to do like the question says really well where it has high resolution guidance to leverage in the first three days. But further out in time where it's basically purely post-processed global ensembles, it is really good at, at kicking butt on a, you know, ETS or high key or threat score. But um, when it comes to, you know, I really want to know what the peak precip is going to be in this basin, um, you know, it, that kind of stuff gets pretty washed out. And, and so I guess that's the short answer is that it's, 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 Right now, its design is such that you would expect it to do really well in bulk verification and less well beyond three days for specific extreme events. But I would say, you know, I think it's still better for extreme events on, say, day six than relying on, you know, the EC and the GFS deterministic forecasts to decide, hey, are we going to get a ton of rain out of this land falling atmospheric river? Um, so hopefully. Hopefully I answered all those questions at least to some degree of um, satisfaction. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's any other questions out there. Thanks. Well, not seeing any others, and hopefully it's not just that people aren't able to figure it out. Oh, there's, there's one more last question for you. Joseph Bellier says, uh, with NBM doing most of the job, do you still expect forecasters to manually modify the values based on their expertise? And the, yeah, the question of that, and this is kind of something, a rumor that we were trying to debunk. The answer to that is absolutely. But the caveat is that we need to be intelligent about it. And, you know, it needs to be the kind of thing where we are manually modifying things where we have a scientifically valid reason for doing so. And it is something that is important for um, doing decision support services, uh, services. So it's kind of thing where, you know, two examples would be, should, you know, I, am, I have a scientifically robust reason for why I should adjust the temperature up three degrees for max T in San Diego in July on the day three forecast. And it's like, even if you have a really good scientifically robust reason for doing that, does it matter for the messaging and is it worth your time is kind of the question. If the answer is no, then we should just let it ride. And the, the flip side would be, um, you know, there's this really high impact wind event coming. My high res wharf says we're going to get 90 mile an hour gusts, um, you know, on a day, you know, like hour 60. And so I'm going to go all in on that one wharf run, even though I have this other guidance that would tell me I should be a little more cautious because the synoptic pattern in many ensemble members isn't actually supportive of Santa Ana's. You know, so that's where it's like, yes, it's important for DSS, but do you have a scientifically robust reason for deviating for the MBM at that point? Maybe no. So, so anyway, to, to summarize, it's like, absolutely, we want forecasters to be identifying targets of opportunity to modify, you know, what automated guidance they'll be getting. Um, it just needs to be the kind of thing where we're doing it, you know, intelligently to maximize the leverage of the human forecaster who, you know, I don't know if even by the end of my career, there will be, the guidance will be so good that the human can add value somewhere. And I'm 35, by the way, 34. So I have ways to go to end to yeah. my career. <laughs> Well, thank you once again, Matt. <clears throat> that was an excellent presentation. I, I want to let you go so we don't take too much of your time and everyone else. Uh, I, I wish we could unmute so we could all clap because that was, that was really a wonderful overview. Um, we will have this recording up as soon as this system can finish its recording and I can get a, a YouTube channel set up for us. Um, and hopefully this will be ready and posted on the website in short order. And then we will have our next presentation sometime in mid-November. And I will be sending out emails with that information as we go along. Thank you very much for joining everyone. Thanks again, Matt. Thanks, Ethan.